it's well it's exactly high noon you want to give david a second or you want to get started it's six o'clock we can begin all right are you recording yes sir okay we do have a quorum uh, i will acknowledge that mayor <clears throat> Pope campbell is joining us currently via phone while her computer reboots and we are awaiting uh Commissioner Sitton to join us, but we do have a quorum. So we're gonna start. Um, as I've done for the past half century, I'm gonna do a roll call to start with. Uh, Commissioner Fort. Here. Commissioner Fuller. Here. Commissioner Michael. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Here. Okay, I'm still waiting on Commissioner Sitton. Um, that being said, Betsy, are you ready to start keying in uh, presentations? Our first item yes, Mayor. is a presentation uh, from the Arts and Science Council. Uh, and I don't know who's going to be on this call other than Krista, Krista Terrell, uh, who I just got an email from today, Krista. Thank you for that email. Okay, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us. And I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, Mayor Knox and uh, Town Council. My name is Krista Terrell. I am the acting president of the Arts and Science Council, Mecklenburg County's local arts agency with a mission of ensuring access to an excellent, relevant and sustainable cultural community for all. I wanna thank you for your trust in ASC to serve the residents of Davison by investing in arts and cultural experiences as, as well as creative individuals and cultural organizations uh, to, for us to serve that through a cultural equity lens. Uh, for fiscal year 2022, ASC is requesting funding from the town of Davison at a level of $25,000. And this evening, we hope to demonstrate to you why you should consider increasing your investment in ASC um, to invest in the arts and cultural sector. Between, between 2018 and 2021, ASC has invested $138,248 in Davidson community players through an operating support grant program. In 2020, ASC administered $17,000 to Davidson community players through the CARES Act funding um, in partnership with Mecklenburg County, the city of Charlotte and Foundation for the Carolinas, which we implemented with Hugh House and Charlotte is Creative. In addition to our investment in Davidson community players, ASC has invested over $90,000 in Davidson based creatives as well as cultural activity there. Um, and I wanna go through a few of those programs with you. Um, our cultural vision grant program directly responds to residents interest in programming that helps build community and demonstrates innovative and relevant programming and transformative cultural expression. Uh, the cultural vision grants program has provided $46,000, excuse me, in direct investment at music at St. Albans Chamber Music Concert Series that provides affordable and diverse performances. The town of Davison's April is for, April is for Arts uh, Festival the Davison's Veteran Monument and a sculptural sensory garden at Roosevelt Wilson Park. Um, those are just a few examples of, of those uh, cultural vision grant investments. Also this fiscal year, we awarded uh, $8,500 to music at St. Albans to support access to music experiences with a focus on reaching minority lower income populations, children and seniors in North Mecklenburg. Through our ASC Culture Blocks program, it is a similar expression um, for desires of residents to have those experiences close to where they live. So we have people on the ground. This is pre-pandemic. We've now moved a lot of it virtually, but really listening and learning from residents about the type of arts, science, and history experiences that they want to have. We understand people can come uptown for the mountaintop experiences, but it's also important to have experiences close to where you live. And so um, those programs can happen in recreation centers, parks, libraries, though they have been great partners with us and relevant community spaces. And so some of the Culture Blocks experiences range from the unplugged and live concert 
series to Ballroom Made Easy, which is an African-American experience that teaches participants the art of urban ballroom line dancing and encouraging the participants to integrate dance as a part of their life. Um, Davidson artists have been a fixture in our Culture Blocks program and ASC has invested um, over $40,000 in them to deliver programming in Davidson and across the county. And lastly, through our artist support program, ASC partners with the North Carolina Arts Council to fund professional and artistic development for emerging and established artists, enhance their skills and abilities to create new works of art and improve on their business operations and the capacity uh, to bring their work to new audiences. Um, in recent years, <clears throat> Davidson Creatives, um, we've helped them to purchase like a slab roller to high quality digital projector and a painting easel for their work. As well as um, an interesting uh, project that helps investigate the displacement of, displacement of people, places, and nature. Um, ASC also fall, provides two fellowship opportunities for artists and Davidson-based artist Irisal Gonzalez received a $5,000 Emerging Creators Fellowship Award in 2020 to support the exploration and execution of a developing a machismo visual art series which focuses on sexism and Latin American culture. So there are just a few examples of how ASC investment um, is helping in the community as well as Davison organizations and creatives. And thank you again for your trust and your partnership with ASC and consideration of increasing your investment to $25,000 in, uh, in FY22. And I also wanna thank you for your appointment of Jacqueline Denneman and Christian Reich to represent Davison on ASC's Northwest Geographic Advisory Council, both of whom have been very involved and responsive in helping us in that work and staying connected to um, North Mecklenburg area. I'm now going to hand it over to Irisal Gonzalez, um, who's kindly offered to share her story with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Irisal Gonzalez. As uh, she mentioned, I am a visual artist and muralist in the city. Um, I live in Davidson, and I would like to share uh, a few of the things that I have been able to do because of ASC. I've worked with them in multiple uh, scenarios with Culture Brock's uh, program. I did some uh, classes, some art technique classes at the Huntersville uh, Library where um, I was offering the classes bilingual in Spanish and English for um, the community. And I had about 15 different participants that uh, gathered every other week week. Um, and I was a, an Emerging Creators uh, Fellow uh, last year to work on my series. Uh, but something that I want to specifically talk to you about is uh, what happened last year as the as COVID started. I had a lot of work that was canceled. Uh, ASC was able to provide artists also with some relief funds. And when um, all of this started, we, we all had to stay home. And I started a project where I partner up with Sherwin Williams, actually of Morseville. They provided the paint. I bought a panel and I started doing a mural outside of my house for people to uh, be able to watch someone paint and just to get some relief from all of the stress of the virus. And um, I, I posted that on Nextdoor. I had more than a hundred people um, be excited about it. I had neighbors who would just walk by uh, to see me paint uh, for the three days that I was out there and just to see the mural. Um, I also had a lot of people online who came from different neighborhoods around Davidson to be able to come see this mural. Um, and I want to share with you a letter that I received from a resident um, that was so, so kind that she expressed it to me and she said, Dear talented artist, your painting of the birds is so beautiful. I've drove by a couple of times as you were painting. The birds are so beautiful and peaceful and the colors are so warm and joyful. My husband just got out of the hospital on Sunday. He had, a, had, he had a heart attack, but he is doing okay. We drive by, we drove by again yesterday and he said your painting made him feel so hopeful. So thank you for sharing your beautiful talent with others. You are a blessing. And I just want to let you all know that, um, that that is just one little piece of how the arts make a difference, not only to me as a creator, but also to the community that gets to benefit from what I'm able to create. Well, Irisol, thank you so much. I mean, I, I I love the mural. I mean, thank you. Did you get to see it? Yeah, 
and and I, so I'm a big bird person anyway. But I mean, the, your colors are so vibrant and everything. So it's just it, it was just awesome. So I'm a big mural person anyway. So that was uh, I like. I, I like say the, he's a big bird person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful. I tried to yeah. include different birds. I don't know if you saw the history behind it, but uh, the yeah. idea was to bring birds of different kinds from different places to signify how all of us, are, our neighbors, are all different people from living in one place. Well, I, I see many of those birds in my backyard, but the, the parakeets, I, I, I have not seen a parakeet in my backyard yet. So <laughs> still wait, waiting for someone's pet to escape and it'll be back there, so. But. Oh goodness. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for uh, listening. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I wish we could get Norfolk Southern to allow you to do some work underneath that railroad trestle because I think that's a perfect opportunity for welcome. I am sad, but yeah. I am also <laughs> in the town board meeting. So. <laughs> and Jim's taking a call off off of mute. But um, but so no, thank you very much. And and hopefully we'll be able to see more of your work around town. And if we can ever get in, uh, Norfolk Southern to play nice with us, I think you'd be a perfect person to to do some of that work for us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you again for having us. We appreciate Krista, it. Th thanks so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate everything that ASC does. I, I know it's been uh, difficult the last couple couple of years with with uh, the dynamics of, of, of economic contributions and everything else. And the arts are so important uh, to all of our communities. And uh, uh, carry that flag and and keep driving the point home because I think we realize how important you are, so. Well, thank you so much, we appreciate you. All righty. You guys take care. All right, Betsy, are you gonna bring my friend Gerald up? So next on the agenda, I'm going to uh, introduce a, a gentleman that is I'm not sure if I'm going to see him or he's got the letter G on his thing. So he's monogrammed. So I, I, I when I introduced Gerald and Gerald and I have not met, we've only we've only exchanged emails thus far, but I, I'm he is a man of, of the goatee, so I'm, I'm happy about that. So we'll have to compare notes on that. Um, I want to introduce everybody to, uh, to Gerald Wright. Um, Gerald came to us, um, gosh, it's been officially 60 or 90 days ago, uh, from Habitat Charlotte via... Um, uh, working in social services in Seattle and uh, started out in LA and went to uh, California State Dominguez with an econ degree and then he went then I lost him Gerald where'd you go bring him back Betsy he's coming back on I think okay oh hey guys Are you there with us yet, Gerald? He's got one of those bad connections. He is unmuted, but I don't see him. Maybe we push him to later in the program or another meeting if, uh, if we've got a bad issue here. Gerald, are you with us? I think we lost him again. Betsy? It, yes, Mayor. I, I don't know what to do with that. I mean, uh, maybe he's coming on again. Let's see if it works this time. General, I got, I, I, you got terrible, you got a terrible connection. Um, I want everyone to know in case you've not had a chance to, to see the uh, press release or anything else that uh, Gerald Wright is now um, 
the head man at the Davidson Housing Coalition. He is, he is only the second director that we've had in the history of the program. We are extremely happy to have him here. He came to us via uh, a, a few years at Habitat Charlotte. Um, and we, we are really excited that he's taken over the Davidson Housing Coalition. Um, we, uh, because of COVID, we, we all have not had the chance to, to meet and, and either drink coffee or break bread, but that day's coming very soon. And uh, I, I look forward to the work and the experience that you bring to the Davidson Housing Coalition, Gerald. Well, thank you, Mayor. I certainly am, am happy to be joining not only the Davidson Housing Coalition, but the town of Davidson uh, with all of the, the efforts and all of the work that you're doing to support affordable housing for all of us in this great community and also for the opportunity to build on a successful 25 year legacy of supporting housing and financial literacy initiatives on behalf of the Davidson Housing Coalition. Um, specifically, I wanna thank the town and your support for uh, the, the upcoming project that we're working on now to bring affordable housing to the former Hulk Lumber site. Uh, this Hope Townhome development is one that we are really excited about to bring high quality housing along with supportive services uh, to the town of Davidson. And I just couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this. And I must also add that time sure flies when you're having fun because I'm actually starting my third week as the executive director of Davidson Housing Coalition. It may feel like 60 to 90 days, but it's really, uh, I'm just starting my third week. Uh, things are moving fast, but I'm definitely happy to be part of it all. Well, welcome. I didn't realize it had been a short three weeks. I, I, I heard news of you uh, well before that three weeks yes. that started. So uh, I was glad when we actually got you signed up and you were here. Yes, I'm definitely happy to be here. And I also am just happy to uh, extend in my, in my welcome, uh, the partnership that we've enjoyed thus far with the Davidson Community Foundation as well. Uh, because I do think that it speaks to the fact that in order to bring affordable housing opportunities to all the members of our community, it really is an endeavor that takes partnership and takes working together uh, no one's going to be able to, to solve this issue alone. And I think the town of Davidson is just a great example of what can happen when we all come together to lend our talents uh, collectively. Well, you, you know firsthand if you did any, any rudimentary research how passionate we are as a group about affordable housing uh, in town. And, and I, I don't think that dynamic will, will ever get any weaker. I think it's only gonna to continue to grow. And it's through uh, the leadership that you're gonna offer the, the uh, you know, I'm so happy that we've, uh, we've got Harold and Ada Jenkins to help facilitate the programs that they're doing in affordable housing. Uh, and then with Eugene Bradley as our new uh, head of our affordable housing uh, and equity inclusion director. I think we have a trifecta of people that are going to help this program, and 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 the the, the push and and acknowledgement of the need for affordable housing in Davidson. Uh, I think we we've, we've got such a solid foundation moving forward. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Yes, thank you, and I could I couldn't agree more. And I would just add, I I'm also thankful for. Uh, the leadership, your leadership uh, for, for the town of Davidson to be able to commit to supporting not only affordable housing, but equity for all. It, it is just, it's monumental. And I think it'll serve as an example, and we will be an example for other towns and other cities to follow that we can do something about this. I, I firmly believe that. 
If I can just jump in and, and Gerald, um, this is Jane Campbell and, and I like uh, the mayor look forward to, uh, to meeting you in person. I went from probably having at least once a week or once every two week meetings in that little conference room right outside your office pre COVID to um, having only stood on the, the doorstep there of the office. But um, we welcome you um, into the job. Know that uh, you're, you're coming in, standing on the, the legacy of the work that's been done up until now um, by the great staff. And then again, as you've already alluded to the, the terrific part partnership with the community. Um, I also wanted to use this opportunity to share. I know that DHC is also well served um, by Anthony Ryback, who is the, yes. um, the Davidson alum who started into that job almost two years ago. But I want to point out that a young man who kind of showed up around that same summer and, and was in a couple of those meetings with us as a uh, as an intern um, working with another organization over the summer, um, Langston Stevens was just announced this week as Davidson's latest um, Watson Fellow. And guess what he's going to be doing over the next year? He's going to be um, researching and looking at affordable housing around the world and bringing it back. Um, the work that he has done with affordable housing and various internships um, has transformed him. And I think this next year will be transformative. So I just look that, that Davidson is that incubator that I think starts and changes lives for people who go on to lives of leadership and service. And, uh, you know, I can point out Liz Kloss and Kelly as well in Charlotte, um, who runs the Roof Above organization. So yes. we look forward to what you will bring here and just how we can basically leverage your talents and the skills of, of those uh, those around us to, uh, to make things better for those in need. But thank you. Welcome. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you, Commissioner Campbell. I, I look forward to meeting you all as well as uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, the, the chair of our board, uh, Mark Washburn, stated, I'm looking forward to meeting you all, Davidson style, really soon. Let's hope that happens. So th thanks again, Gerald, for your leadership. Thanks for being here and welcome. Thank you all so much. Okay. With that, we're going to move on. Thank you again, Gerald. Mr. Justice. Any changes to the agenda? No changes, Mayor. All right. This time I'm going to turn it over to uh, Town Manager Jamie Justice and Economic Development Director Kim Fleming for our uh, COVID-19 uh, summary. Sounds good, Mayor. We've got a brief update for the board. I got a few quick hitters and then Kim has got some information to share. So, uh, so the news today, the governor announced the executive order 204. So that's titled further easing of restrictions on businesses and gatherings. And so continue the mask mandate and the social distancing, but there's a, a list of uh, areas where things that can be loosened up a little bit in regards to our businesses and, uh, and gatherings. So, so that is good news. And uh, we'll have the, uh, we have that on our web town website. Everybody wants to go take a look at what that, executive order says. Of course, it's on the state website as well. So I'm sure Kim will talk a little bit about the business impact of that. From a data standpoint, state has for our 28036 zip code. Right now, our cumulative cases are 1,505 and 15 deaths, which hasn't moved all that much in the last two weeks. So that's good. And then Davidson College, as of today, has three active cases with the 2,129 regularly tested students, faculty, and staff. So very, very good numbers from that standpoint. And then vaccine really is the major topic just from an availability standpoint. What I've gotten from the county policy calls is the state and the county are all expecting the vaccine supply to really ratchet up as we get to the latter part of this month and into April. So that's good news that we've got expecting a real real big slug of vaccine coming in. And then from a penetration rate standpoint for Mecklenburg County for our population based on the state numbers, we've got about 16 and a half percent that are partially vaccinated and a little over 10 percent that are fully vaccinated. So those numbers are starting to creep up, not going as fast as we would all like, but they are moving up and will hopefully move quickly 
as we continue through in the groups, uh, through group four and then hopefully group five soon, as the governor mentioned, moving in to towards May. So that's the uh, kind of the quick hitter status report. And Kim has got some information she wants to share about businesses and then also vaccine clinics. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so I just wanted, I just have a couple of quick things to update you all on. Um, let's see, do you have that? Okay, it doesn't, it's one slide. Ooh. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank um, the board and our staff that participated in the second dose vaccine clinic in the pouring down rain um, on March 16th. Um, I think it was another testament to how important our citizens are to all of us that people stood out there in the pouring rain with umbrellas to get everybody into the Ada Jenkins Center and 236 people received their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine on that day. So, I mean, tremendous thanks. I know that um, many people um, standing around a heater burnt their coats and umbrellas and um, other things. So we appreciate your sacrifice. Um, and I think because we have shown that we can operate a successful vaccine clinic, and again, thanks to all of you for um, advocating to have clinics in Davidson. We are going to have a 500 person vaccine clinic on April 10th at Davidson College. Um, they, Mecklenburg County Health Department is hoping that this will be the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so it would be the one shot and done. Um, the National Guard will be here for uh, that clinic and um, the college is all set um, for that. And so we're just really excited to be able to have a place in Davidson that folks can go to get their vaccine. Um, Signups will be forthcoming and anyone that needs to get the vaccine and the scheduled groups will be available, that will be available for them on April 10th. So that is great news. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, just bring you up to speed on is um, how the American Rescue Plan will benefit our businesses in town. The biggest thing really out of this is the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, um, which is great news for our restaurants. It's what um, many of our restaurant owners have been advocating for over the course of really the last year. Um, what this does is allow restaurant owners to apply for a grant, um, which would really make them whole between the revenue that was lost due to the pandemic. So they are able to apply for a grant uh, based on the differential in their revenue between 2019 and 2020, minus any PPP funding that they received. Um, the caveat to this is that um, the feds are going to pay this directly. It will be administered through the SBA. The application is not available yet, um, but restaurants need to uh, become a system of award management with the federal government. So they need a Dun & Bradstreet number and, um, and then they need to apply to be, it's, it's a SAM um, payee. Uh, and that usually takes um, a couple of weeks. So we have let all of our restaurants know that who's interested in applying for these funds to get all of this set up so that when the grant becomes available, they will be ready to roll and get their applications in early. Um, that there will also be a 21 day period when the grant opens up that um, minority and women businesses will be able to apply 
So that's also good news for um, some of our restaurant operators. So I'm very confident that any of our restaurants that want to apply for this uh, will get in and will get the funding that's available. So that's great news. The other thing is the shuttered venue operating grant, um, which this is available to venues um, that sell tickets to events. So our town cinema and the Davidson community players is our, um, these grants are available to them. And um, again, that will make them whole in terms of the revenue that was lost. So again, two really great um, funds and grants that have been established to help our small businesses. Um, and that was all that I had. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, but I think we are pretty well positioned to have our businesses receive a lot of this funding. Well, when you, you know, say grants, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, when you say grants, are those loans? Are those to be paid? You okay? They don't need to be paid back. It's just like the PPP funding that if they meet the criteria, it's fully forgivable. Uh, fully forgivable. So Kim, you know how I, 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 we've been standing the mayor up at events. So just, I'm gonna put this out there for the people that, that run the, the movie theater. If by happenstance, Godzilla versus King Kong that comes out on the 31st happens to be playing, the mayor will volunteer to be there as a PR thing. So, um, no, I'll seriously. I'll let them know. Thank you. Um, e even with the new orders that the governor released today, I, I, I wanna remind everybody uh, to continue practicing the social distancing guidelines and, and the masking and everything else. I, we're just so close that we, we don't need to botch this up. It, it, it's, we're, we're, you know, you can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think uh, the, the more we adhere to the guidelines that we, we're all used to now for the last year, uh, I think the, the better place we're gonna be 30, 60, 90 days from now. So uh, I, I'm gonna continue to mask. I know Rock Hill passed a thing today. Um, they did away with their mask ordinance completely in the city of Rock Hill. I, I'm still wearing one. I'm still gonna wear one. Uh, and, I, and I hope that everybody else feels the same way right now. So um, again, I think I'm gonna sigh on the side of safety. I think it's more important. So, uh, but at any rate, thank you, Kim, for, for those updates too, because uh, uh, I, you have truly been a rock star during this, this pandemic. And, and I, I've had merchants tell me that and, and they, I don't know that they have expressed how much they appreciate and maybe they have in a roundabout way, but I'm getting different stories from them. They, they, uh, I, I've had some businesses uh, just tell me that if it weren't for you, they wouldn't be here. Oh, thanks. But it's our whole staff and you all, it's you're, our team. We're a good team. Staff. Your team. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Kim, thank you and, and all of the staff for everything that you've done. I know a lot of hours and uh, volunteering for the for the vaccine and, and a lot of hard work on making sure that our small businesses, which are kind of a, a big part of, which are a big part of what make Davidson such a unique and special place. So um, thank you for all the, to everybody for all the help and hard work and just keep doing, just keep doing you, Kim, because it's, uh, it's, it's great. <laughs> thank you. And I just say to, to the mayor's point in terms of, you know, keeping up the effort, um, you know, we look at those percentages that, that Jamie alluded to, we are under 20% of the population that is fully vaccinated. Um, so to me, I look at it, there's still a lot of people at risk. I'm extremely grateful for the number of um, older residents and residents with medical um, issues, but this we still, we still have a ways to go, but you know that coupled with the fact that I think we're gonna see the, the dramatic larger numbers in the vaccine 
but um, you know, keep it up. I still say that that you know, you may be the one person to have a conversation to ask somebody if they're going to get vaccinated to be the one to convince them to do that um, and convince them to to look into the science and you know, and to make that decision. So um, don't don't underestimate the power that that you have to be able to convince somebody. Um, to get vaccinated for those around them. Agreed. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much. Okay, at this time we move on to item number five, which is public comment. When it, Jim? Jim, you got something to say? Unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. Unmuted. Yeah, you're good now. Okay. Not only that, but I got the uh, approval. I actually hit the right button. There you go. Hey, here is my question. We have in gradations followed, I think, almost exactly the governor's uh, requirements on everything from masks to, uh, to opening uh, businesses and restaurants. Do we have in place a policy that says whatever the governor says we follow unless we change that or do we stay where we are until we change it without regard to what the governor does? Uh, Karen, what I recall is that we, we, did, we let the local orders expire so that we could comply with the state orders. So we are following along with that. So to your question, the town of Davidson would need to take a specific action to do something different than what the state is doing right now, if that helps. Yep, that's correct, Jamie. But if we take no action, then we are presumed to follow the state guidelines. Fair statement? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Jim. Okay, so at this point, we move on to item number five, which is public comment. Betsy? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have received three public comments via email that I will read. The first email received uh, on March 22nd, 2021 from Cole Barton. I'm concerned about the plans for the old Mecklenburg Brewery proposal. I recognize its appeal for the citizens of Cornelius and many of us beer aficionados in Davidson. That said, I do not see how a planned road from this large residential and recreational development onto South Street could be any more egregious. The imagined road is roughly adjacent to the new greenway behind the left field fence of the southernmost McEver baseball field. The proposed road would require anyone proceeding south from Davidson on South Street to make a right-hand turn into the development along the newest Greenway extension. Cornelius residents in the new development will have an option to turn left directly in front of the Davidson Elementary School or to turn right into antiquity. I hope that our mayor and commissioners can persuasively represent our view that the road is dangerous on a blind curve and inconveniently reroutes existing traffic patterns. It's my understanding that the Cornelius board and the project's developers may not be cooperative if not, I certainly hope we might take similar license from their traffic routing conveniences to themselves and prohibit left prohibit left-hand turns from this new development onto South Street. Most importantly, the new roads connection will occur between two blind curves, increasing risk, if not posing hazards, to school children, baseball players, and recreational users of the Greenway. This seems particularly galling in offense in light of the many other options to getting into and out of the new development with existing roads. It's not apparent to me why the developers have not come up with ways to connect the new Cornelius residents onto 115 from the west side of the proposed development. 
Thank you for this opportunity to represent my views and for all you do for Davidson. Yours, Cole Barton. Second public comment was received by email on March 23rd, 2021 from Steve Sonnenberg. Mayor Knox, thank you for your response to my comments to last month's meeting. Your links provided interesting info. However, these links contain no information on status or results of the board's 5 June 2020 directed racial equity review of all town practices, policies, and programs. So those questions remain open. Comments on draft non-discrimination ordinance. What is the compelling case or demonstrated necessity for this ordinance? Many local, state, and federal ordinances or laws already exist, making dis discrimination illegal. The presentation lays out the legal background as to why North Carolina towns can now do this, but it contains no data to support why Davidson needs to do it. If the town goes down this road, it needs to clarify or define some of the terms in the draft ordinance for the public to properly evaluate it. For example, in the proposed protected class, what does, quote, color mean? Skin color? Most definitions of, quote, race include skin color. So why include, quote, color here? It is redundant. What does, quote, sex mean? I assume the draft ordinance is not intending to refer to the physical activity. Do you really mean, quote, gender? If so, use this proper term. Sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Rather, use a single, overarching, or comprehensive term for these three. What does, quote, familial status mean? Quote, natural hair or hairstyles. Really? Seriously? These would put the ordinance into the realm of absurdity. If the town goes down this path, it opens the door for an unending list of other equally inappropriate protected classes. For example, what about wearing wigs? Are they not, quote, natural hair? How about body piercings, tattoos, being tall, being short, being slim, being obese, being wealthy, being poor, being left-handed, wearing glasses, wearing, quote, outlandish makeup, one's address, one could go on and on quote, handicap or disability. Why use both of these terms? Isn't disability the appropriate term as used in the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990? Simply use disability in protected class. For the public to properly evaluate this draft ordinance, additional information is needed. What happened after town's investigation, the town initiated meeting or conversation with the parties does not resolve the issue. Is legal action taken by town, civil action, criminal action? If the latter, what kind? Misdemeanor or felony? Why? What penalties go with ordinance violation? Fine? How much? Jail? How much? Both. Thank you. The third public comment was received by email on March 23rd, 2021 from Barbara Bryant. Because one town or county is breaching another's county line with heavy equipment seems to be a big deal, could you pl please post any and all documents showing who signed what agreement or permission for Met County's Charlotte Water to lay pipes in Iredell County? When were papers signed and with what details? Surely there is a memorandum of understanding between counties as well as towns. When, where, and including which people in what stated capacity was this accomplished and with what kind of and how much notice to interested citizens? Further, status of the proposed, quote, boundary adjustments. Who prepares their details? When will they and any other land agreements, exchanges, or jurisdictional swaps, including taxes, be available for study prior to an official signing? Will that signing event be open to the public? Where? Is the Carolina General Assembly involved in any way in ultimate border adjustments? And if so, to what extent have they, name individuals in official status, been involved in the rushed vote from the TOD BOC work session on March 9. With Charlotte Water agreeing to the vote at tonight's meeting would be satisfactory, a meeting regularly featuring both voting and public comment, it's unfortunate as well as awful with optics not to have any, not to have waited until for even a predetermined plan with ready reasonings, although none yet for, quote, what's in for Iredell and Mooresville. Just who is ensuring health and delicate Lake Davidson? 
Can Davidson really handle more traffic generated in from NC 115 South in Aradale County? Thank you for quickly posting documents that will better illuminate a topic so far apparently only a win-win win for Davidson with a single town hall or county board at the table to describe or explain the deal from all realistic angel, angles. Signed, Barbara Bryan. And that concludes the public comment, Mayor. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, all three of these issues are, are, are in the hopper for discussion, um, either tonight or at an upcoming board meeting. So I, I, I think to all those that, uh, made the comments, um, look, look for, uh, both discussions tonight and at, at, uh, our, our upcoming board meetings, as well as anything that we may, uh, uh, we may send out in uh, the manager's reports and things like that. I mean, we'll be posting things on all of these topics on the website as we move forward. But uh, <coughs> Jamie, anything you want to add on that? Just you said it more, more opportunities for public comment for public review on all those items as we go forward. So you're absolutely right. Okay. And uh, thank all those that did make public comments and, uh, Let's move on to uh, the next item on the agenda. That is item six, which is the consent agenda. There are four, four items on consent agenda. I need a motion to approve. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda as um, cited with the four items as listed. <coughs> All right, Mayor Pro Tem Campbell has made a motion to approve. Any discussion? Then I'm gonna do a roll call. Commissioner Fort? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Yes. Commissioner Michael? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell? Yes. Thank you, that carries 4-0. And again, I'm gonna acknowledge again that at, at, at this point right now in our meeting, Commissioner Sitton, still has not joined us and, and I hope that he's going to. I, I've not received notice one way or another yet. Uh, I did text him, uh, so I, I, I was paying attention to the meeting. I wasn't texting and meeting, but I didn't write. I was trying to get him, so. Um, with that, we move on to item number seven, which is old business. And at this point, uh, Betsy is gonna bring up our planning director, Jason Burdett. Hello, Jason. Hey, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Let me see if I can start my video and share my screen. Here we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Good to see you tonight. Um, I'm gonna to provide a quick um, and very high level update on chapter 160D uh, text amendments. Um, moving, you'll, you'll see this in the uh, coming months. Uh, moving forward, we have a July 1st deadline to get these adopted. And this is because of uh, the General Assembly's uh, recent legislation in 2019. So to provide some background, in 2019, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly adopted a complete reorganization of the state statutes related to planning and development. And they created a new st um, statute called 160D. Um, it's the first wholesale reorganization of state development statutes since 1905. And 160D consolidates the standards for cities and the standards for counties and puts them into a single unified uh, development uh, chapter. And um, the intent here is to provide a more logical and coherent organization. There's not a whole, there's not substantive policy changes at all. Um, it's, it's more of a um, organization and uh, compliance with um, like terms and definitions. Um, it doesn't change any of the authority granted to local government. Um, there are some clarifying amendments and consensus reforms that will need to be adopted into the DPO. And this doesn't just impact us, this impacts uh, 650 jurisdictions across the state. 160D is effective now, um, but towns in, across the state have until July 1st to incorporate um, all the changes into their ordinances. 
Um, and actually, you guys have already um, seen the first section um, related to appeals and variances and approved that in December of 2020. David Cole brought those forward. Um, I was just going to provide a high level um, summary of the various topics that are a part of the 160D update. Uh, first up are terminology and citations. Um, all old references to the um, previous statute need to be removed and we need to incorporate terminology consistent with definitions listed in 160D. Uh, geographic jurisdictions um, were required to provide clarification for parcels located in two jurisdictions, specifically um, for property owners in, in two jurisdictions, they have the right with um, both towns consent to um, develop under a um, one jurisdiction's um, ordinance. Um, but again, that's required. Um, both jurisdictions would have to agree to that. As for governing boards, um, conflict of interest uh, standards for governing and advisory boards are required, including oaths um, for advisory boards and governing boards. A lot of this already is taking place, but this just codifies these requirements. Also, we need to update ETJ population estimates to ensure proportional representation in uh, quasi-judicial boards. As far as land use administration, um, we need to make sure that staff has a, a conflict of interest standard um, adopted into the ordinance or a policy. Um, and also uh, notices of violation need to make sure we're in compliance with the updated state statute. As far as zoning ordinances and other ordinances, um, Betsy has some new um, uh, responsibilities. She must maintain the current and historical zoning maps. So we'll coordinate with you, um, Betsy, as this comes online. Um, also, uh, the uh, conditional use zoning is eliminated. That's a little confusing. Conditional use is actually a relic from the 1970s. It's a quasi-judicial approval. It is not the same as conditional zoning, which is a legislative approval. Um, but all of the old conditional use um, zonings, um, which we don't have in town, must be converted to conditional zoning. But I just wanted to make sure that was in here because we did used to have conditional use zoning in our ordinance. Um, also, um, jurisdictions may allow minor administrative modifications to conditional approvals. Um, we don't have that ability right now, uh, but if we choose to do so, um, at your discretion, we would have to define what those um, uh, minor administrative modifications are or would be. Um, also, uh, subdivision performance guarantees must comply with state statute. Um, we need to standardize the process for housing code enforcement. Um, as well as any development agreement um, approved by a legislative body is a legislative decision um, with a local government as a party to that agreement. And um, we must adopt our comprehensive plan by 2022, which we actually did in uh, January 2020. So we are ahead of the game on that one as well. Um, as far as legislative decision, um, there are, we need to make sure we have all the statutory requirements for legislative decisions included in our ordinance. This includes noticing requirements, for any text changes, as well as map amendments, also known as rezonings. Uh, consistency statements and statements of reasonableness um, need to be included for map amendments. Uh, we do that already, it's just not codified in our ordinance. Um, the planning board needs to provide a consistency statement. They are doing this, they have done this for a number of years. Um, also, uh, any applicant uh, written consent is required for a conditional zoning approval. As far as quasi-judicial decisions, this relates to our design review board, historic preservation board, um, commission and board of adjustment. They need to follow statutory procedures involving um, evidentiary hearings and findings of fact. We do that now. We just need to clean up some of the language to align with um, the new language. Um, this relates to evidence standing and appeals specific to any quasi-judicial proceeding. As far as administrative approvals and determinations, um, those must be provided in writing, but electronic uh, notification is permitted. Um, applica any application must be made by a person with a property interest or a contract um, on the property, um, and any approval runs with the land should the property owner change. Um, determinations um, are and required delivery of determinations um, that's typically written, but electronic is permitted as well as um, new language specific to appeals and fines and statutory compliance. Uh, getting close to the end here, vested rights. There are statutory limits for vested rights specific to building permits and development approvals. 
Um, we do that now, that's in our ordinance, um, but also there's vesting specific to multi-phase development. That's something we'll need to update. Um, and lastly, uh, judicial review, there are, there's a specific appeals process for certificates of appropriateness and landmarks. Those are both related to the Historic Preservation uh, Commission's um, wheelhouse and timing associated with those appeals. So we'll need to make sure those are updated as well. As far as the process to date, um, planning staff and the town attorney um, attended a UNC School of Government training specific to 160D in early January, 2020. So this is over a year ago. Um, planning staff has been working on developing uh, draft changes in accordance with 160D over the last year. Uh, we've been using the resources um, available at hand, which include uh, the UNC School of Government. They've got a new book out that we've um, been treating as pretty much the Bible for these updates. Um, we have a School of Government uh, checklist to ensure that um, everything we're doing is uh, correct, um, as well as referring to School of Government um, uh, blog postings on the subject. They, they're, they're really coming out weekly because everyone is working on this um, across the state, as well as uh, questions directed specifically to school government staff. Um, and and as, all, um, as with all text amendments, we will um, coordinate with the town attorney to, um, for their review um, throughout the process. Uh, next steps, um, all uh, planning ordinance text amendments follow section 14.19.3 specific to amending the Davidson Planning Ordinance. This includes a required public hearing, which is tentatively scheduled for May 11th, a planning board recommendation, uh, which we're shooting for May 24th, and a board of commissioners decision, which could take place either at the June work session or the June regular meeting. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have um, specific to 160D. I think, um, Jason, we, we received an email on uh, vest, the vested rights part of it. So what I wouldn't mind doing is, is maybe at the next meeting going into a little bit more details on the from to there and what's going on. And I think it, it is it is one that's always interesting, which is we have some of these development approvals that have been approved 15, 20 years ago that seem to live on for forever. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody's behooved to just go get a plan approved and let it sit idle for ever, right? I mean, even, even as it relates to the, the conditionally approved plan uh, on parcels A and B out by the community school of Davidson, right? I mean, that lives on presumably in perpetuity, right? Yeah, um, that one, if you wanna to get to the details of that specific one, it's because it was developed as, as four tracks with um, impervious allotments. But yeah, to, to answer your question, we could completely um, provide a little more detail perhaps at the public hearing when we flesh out exactly what that vested rights change would be. But I, I, again, I don't think it's anything substantial. It's just clarifying um, the requirements of vesting. Yeah, I, I would recommend we do it before the public hearing so that the public has time to listen to the information, digest the information, and then provide further questions on it. So I think, I think it would be beneficial to not spring something on somebody and then just say, okay, now react. Okay. Just, just vested rights is, was the concern. Is that right? That was the one area that I've seen questions on. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that was also the email that brought up the question, your reference to the town attorney, but realizing that since early 2020, we have gone from that town attorney to an interim and will be transitioning to a new town attorney. So I think just making sure that we're referencing and being able to note um, whether our incoming town attorney has completed all of those things is, is who we need to be referencing. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Jason, I just wanted to clarify what 160D does with vested rights <laughs> may not substantially change anything as it relates to looking at a particular development project. And I guess that's the question that we need to make sure we understand. And if that's separate, then kind of to Commissioner Campbell's point, like we've got to if this is a different way to interpret this, we need our town attorney, new town attorney to weigh in on that at the appropriate time. So I guess I just want to clarify, I'm not sure exactly when we should be, what, what this is and which, when we should be discussing it, because it does feel like two different things. Jason, could you, is there any color you can add to that? Well, I could, I have the school of government checklist right here and I can tell you exactly, um, I haven't 
had the chance to dive into what the vested rights um, change would be outside of being told by the school government that it's just um, largely uh, just organization. But I can tell you exactly, um, the school government says that we must recognize that building permits are valid for six months as under prior law. We do that now. We, we must recognize that the default rule that development approvals are valid for 12 months unless adjusted by statute or local rule. We do that now. Um, must identify sites of specific vesting plans uh, with vesting for two to five years. Um, those are uh, conditional as under prior law, except for specified exceptions. Must recognize multi-phase developments. This is something we've done, we have not done. Long-term projects of at least 25 acres with vesting up to seven years, except for specified exceptions. Um, may provide for administrative termination of vested rights and for appeal to the Board of Adjustment. And um, just be aware that a person claiming vested rights may bring in um, original civil action in court, skipping administrative determination and board of adjustment consideration. And be aware that vested rights run with the land, except for state permitted outdoor advertising permits that run with the owner of the permit. So that's, that's in essence the, um, what um, the vested rights section of 160D is requiring. Um, yeah, Jason, I went back and looked at the email and noticed that neither you nor Jamie were on it. So I just kicked it over to, to the both of you just so you, you're, you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? So um, now I've forwarded you the email so that you- Okay, can... thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think it's really just more of a question on the vested rights, which is, you know, how do these projects continue to exist in perpetuity for <clears throat> forever? Um, when you think about vested rights of Davidson Point uh, you know, the, the development of the, of the, the last 22 units, um, you know, our, our, our favorite Davidson Bay project that continues to go on in perpetuity, you know, the four parcels, you know, is, is there ever a st end date in sight for those? So I think it's, it's really just a question of, I, I get that our ordinance addresses it. Uh, it, it. I think it's just really more clarification about what exactly how are we really addressing it? And, and here's some kind of specific examples and here's why these get to live on for forever. Yeah, we, we've answered that question a number of times and I'm happy to do so again. And, and I can give you a, an abbreviated answer right now is that if when there's a master plan approved, you have a certain amount of time to move to the next step, which is a preliminary plat, construction drawings. And if you haven't done so by a certain amount of time, your master plan approval goes away. Um, but once you've you've moved on to the construction drawing sets, you have a certain number of time to begin construction. And if you haven't done so, that approval goes away. Um, but if you are continually working on the project, whether it's one <coughs> building one house or 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 um, building another street per year, um, if you're continuing to show work on the project, it's it's still an active project. And that's and that's hard um, when you have large scale projects like a Davidson East or a Davidson Bay, or even I, I would argue um, the Southeast Quadrant uh, Master Plan, um, which is where um, uh, like Davidson Clinic is out by the circles. Um, that's, that's a vested project because of the infrastructure and um, that, that's been laid there. So th those approvals are still valid. Um, they've, cons they've still considered to work on it. We had a, a Davidson Gateway building that was just approved last year, it hasn't been built yet, but that has an approval. So um, there, there's each situation is a, a little interesting and, a, and, and it's unique, but um, I can understand some frustration with um, like a Davidson Bay taking forever to be built. But um, that, that's also a function of um, developers changing hands over time and um, work continuing over time. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, again, it just, it, so I guess, to the to the four parcels by uh, by community school Davidson, it's got a master plan approved. Technically, the development of parcel D says now we're continuing to do work on that, which means that parcels A and B gets to live on for how much longer before work has to happen on that question. Yeah, I, I didn't make that determination, but. Um, uh... I'm, I'm just, I'm making yeah. it up, right? I'm just, I'm, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. using it. I mean, I, I don't know why you wouldn't make that case if, if you can push some dirt around and say, well, we're working on it. I, I agree. Um, there are some very developer friendly state statutes out there. Um, 
Um, they have a strong lobby, but um, the, t- the termination was made. Those were developed together, even though they've been sold off individually and the uh, impervious allocation has been allotted uh, um, because of the, uh, the collective development nature of that, of that piece. So. Yeah, I'm not talking about impervious allocation though, Jason. I think we're kind of talking past one another. Parcels A and B have an approved plan. How long are those, is that approved plan good for before it expires? Well, the last approved plan was a hotel, which was removed. Right. So there is no approved, approved. there is no approved plan outside of the impervious allocation for that site. Okay. Fair enough. But I'd say, Matthew, to your point, and Jason, if you're still looking for additional information, is this something where maybe a um, a short brief at either one of our April meetings, so prior to the May 11th meeting, just, you know, I got it. We, we just did this kind of off the top of the head, but maybe, you know, one, two or three slides that says, you know, here's an example of something and whether it's, you know, Davidson Point or Davidson Bay, you know, this is a project that was approved in X and this is where, and then if the slide turns around and says that essentially the changes that we're talking about with regards to 160D are not really relevant to any of those, but maybe just providing the additional information of where we stand. Um, you know, I think that that might be helpful before we get to Matt, <clears throat> before we get to the public hearing, um, so that we've just had an information brief at, at one of our April meetings prior to that. Okay. I, I'm one of five though. So I'm just, I'm, I'm seeing if there's, if there's concurrence for that kind of a concept, um, based on what Matthew mentioned, instead of trying to do it all at the May 11th meeting. I was just going to ask, would that be helpful to everybody? Because I'm, I'm hearing it'd be nice to have a primer on this topic and we can do that separately. Does the rest of the, does everybody want to do that? Yes, please. Sure. Okay, perfect. Yes. Get down as an action item. Jason, we'll figure out timing on that. Okay. Any other questions? Jason, thanks. The, uh, sure, thank you all. You know, I, I realize a lot of this is just cleaning up a mess that's been going on for a long time. And I think it's, it's about time a lot of this stuff was brought in the line. So uh, there, there's enough confusion on the local level, much less the, the, the county and state level. So to bring a lot of stuff into alignment by this 160D uh, <coughs> is, is important for communities across the state. So thank you. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think I think getting everything all cleaned up is absolutely. But I think while we're in the middle of cleaning up the house, if there's some opportunity to maybe dot some eyes and cross some T's T's that have been missed, we should we should take advantage of that and do it right once. So if there's if there's anything that's out there that you'd recommend adding to this or making sure that we're adding some additional points of clarification, clarification, I'd be welcome to do that. All right. And I would say that you could use it as the venue to maybe even suss out more of what you said in terms of things that are not our purview um, that um, essentially reside with the General Assembly. Um, that's always helpful to residents. Um, they don't always they don't always like it when we say we're not allowed to do anything about that, but um, it's helpful to understand what is within the General Assembly purview versus within the municipality purview. Anything else? Jason, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Next, we move on to item number eight, which is new business. And I'm going to call on our natural assets and sustainability coordinator, Charlene Miner. I see her name. And Matt Wall, our livabil- uh, who is a livability board member to give us an update on uh, where we are with our sustainability plan. I am here and my video is taking a moment. It's a day for technical difficulties. It is (laughs) all in one meeting. Um, Mayor, while Charlene is getting her video situation worked out, I just wanted to say and take a moment that this is really 
um, an exciting presentation tonight leading from one of your strategic plan goals. Uh, um, so, and there's Charlene, so I will stop filling that air. And Charlene, it's your turn. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction. And thank you. Um, good evening to everyone, Mayor and Commissioners. And um, as Karen said, I'm Charlene Miner. Um, my focus is on natural assets and sustainability, and I'm in the Parks and Recreation Department. And you've now met Matt Walt, and he is a member of the Livability Board, brand new member, and um, he is representing the Sustainability Committee. Um, we thank you for this opportunity and your leadership on this topic. And tonight we will um, have a slide presentation for you. And Betsy, is that something that you'll pull up or? Um, I can't, what? unless you have it ready. Oh, okay. Um, sure, if you want to, that would be great. Okay, give me just a moment. Oh, okay. Um, while Betsy is pulling that up, we'll discuss some background. Um, we will um, discuss um, the recommendations that the committee has come up with. And then we'll present some potential budget items that will be like for staff consideration. So we'll do that. Um, it's going to be a minute. I'm having to be oh, okay. connection issues. Sorry. Oh, okay. I can pull it up. I got it. It's okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Super. And um, Charlene, I don't think I have it on my drive. Do you have it available? Sure. Yeah, it's fine. Um, hold on just a moment. Okay. Are you able to see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Super. Um, okay, great. Um, and so I went through the first slide and so Matt will go ahead and lead us in the second slide. Great. Uh, hi everybody. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to speak this evening and, and contribute to this project. So uh, just, just diving in, in, in 2020, a new sustainability committee was formed with members sourced via the town's planning and livability uh, community advisory boards. And I'll just highlight that uh, we do have a Davidson College student as one of our participants. Um, so with Charlene and Trey Akers leading on behalf of town staff, uh, we got going in earnest with our first official meeting on December 1st. And shortly thereafter, uh, the committee's progress uh, began to collate around town plans, uh, a Davidson specific report containing a sustainability recommendations, um, courtesy of UNC Charlotte's Master of Public Administration program, along with an ever growing body of uh, foundational research that we've been performing. Uh, we otherwise have consulted the full planning and livability boards uh, um, and received endorsement to proceed with this presentation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so from the onset, the committee's decisions have been guided by Davidson's core values as expressed via the comprehensive, strategic, uh, and otherly, other publicly vetted plans um, as shown here in the uh, the graphic and we can keep moving. So, you know, as I mentioned, the committee's been as referenced to relevant priority strategies from town plans. Um, most notably, as directed by the strategic plan, we have uh, principally set out to define the desired outcomes of the town's sustainability efforts. Uh, goal 2.3 here on the slide is an example from the comprehensive plan, which had environmental preservation and sustainability as recurring themes. Okay, the committee also considered what is happening on a larger scale. Many efforts have been underway for years. Um, the Davidson College Climate Action Plan was compiled in 2010. Some more recent efforts have been seen on federal and state level, including North Carolina's Executive Order 80 and the Clean Path Plan. 66 North Carolina businesses have 100% renewable energy goals and over 20 local municipalities and counties have adopted similar policies. 
Um, you can see at the bottom of the slide here, a common target shared by many of these plans is carbon neutrality by 2050. So one um, challenge we found as a committee is that Davidson does not have um, usable um, baseline data. So this summer, we're going to work with a Davidson College sustainability scholar who's going to help us collect municipal energy use data. And so why is that important? Well, we want to have a starting point benchmark, something that we can report back to you on to show progress. Um, below here, you'll see an example. This is uh, Chapel Hill's data. It's a little different from what ours might be, but what's helpful about this, you can see the municipal operation, greenhouse gas emissions, the two sectors where we see the most emissions is vehicle fleet and facilities, and that's quite significant. And then community greenhouse gas emissions by sector um, for the whole community really is heavily weighted in the buildings and transportation sector as well. So again, <coughs> Davidson's um, data may be different, but this does give you a sense of where we should maybe be putting some of our efforts, resources, and energy and where um, improvements can be made. And I'll pause here for questions and then we'll move on to the sustainability framework document. Okay. All right, um, this here is a representation of the sustainability framework document that the committee compiled and it was in your agenda packet and this is, um, even though these priority areas are numbered, they are not actually in a rank order. And this is something that is a broad outline that will lead into short and long-term efforts. Part of the framework includes an outcome statement. So Davidson will strive to create and maintain a vibrant, equitable community and economy while protecting the natural environment for current and future generations. And the town will cultivate a community ethic of sustainability through five priority areas. And we'll go through these. So again, these are not in a rank order, but we did, the committee does feel strongly that as with most things in Davidson, we felt that um, strong community engagement and partnerships are so important. And the framework actually reflects a lot of the past efforts that have been underway for years. Um, also the strength of volunteers and numerous partnerships, business, nonprofit partnerships, et cetera, um, of special importance to the committee was really focusing in on involving underrepresented groups into this conversation in this process. Okay, and then priority area two reflects town operations and the committee's vision was really that the town would be a driver, an exemplar, and a model, uh, I'm sorry, and the leader in this area. And that we really feel like if we can align town projects with some of the grants and other opportunities that are coming online, I'm sure you've all seen a lot in the news lately, there's a lot happening in this area. So we really want to be ready for that and not miss out on opportunities. Um, we also have the opportunity to um, have more peer networking, and that will help with innovative solutions across different town departments and yield energy savings and return on investments. So there's a lot of work to do, but there's a lot that's actually in process and folks we can borrow from. So we like that. Okay, and then you'll notice that some of the um, blue text here, that represents items that are taken from the comp plan and then the asterisk notes items that will be in future budget slides. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, priority area three, there's a focus on green buildings and infrastructure here. 
Um, we really feel like by supporting renewable energy projects and improved efficiency, such as LED street lights, solar, and adaptive reuse of buildings. So something that we're already doing. Um, by working with our partners, such as the EPA and the county on stormwater management and um, trying some new things like the bioretention gardens at Huff High School or working with local businesses who utilize safer lawn care methods, we could make really great inroads there. Um, the committee really sees immediate impact to reduce energy burden for low-income families. So we really see the connection between um, sustainability and affordability. affordability. Um, so that's something that we will continue to talk about. That's really important to the committee. And we'll, of course, work with neighborhood leaders like um, folks from Davidson Housing Coalition and Eugene, of course. All right, and Matt will pick it up on priority area four. Yeah, so on mobility, the committee is essentially uh, you know, recommending that we double down on components of the uh, 2019 mobility plan with a focus in, in two areas, um, electrical, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure and, and multimodal. And, you know, none of this will be news um, to the audience here. Uh, you know, I think we can, most of us can agree at this point that mass electrification is, is a matter of, of when, not if, and there's certainly no shortage of ambitious uh Vehicle manufacturer uh, manufacturer announcements, um, you know, um, week by week, and you know, uh, we be believe that beyond greenhouse gas reduction, EV infrastructure should attract visitors to Davidson's commercial establishments and properties available for rent. Um, currently. Um, we're aware of only one uh, public charging station that's uh, in town on um, South Main Street in front of, of Davidson Ice House. So, you know, have, have some room to build on top of that. And in terms of multimodal, you know, uh, just enhanced connectivity, it will hopefully pull cars off the road, um, attract attention to, to the existence of alternatives, and also just generally contribute to the interconnectedness of town that, you know, attracts so many to, to spend time here in the first place. Go down. And then just to round out the framework um, in terms of long term priorities, we are suggesting continued commitment to the town's uh, planning methods, complemented by priorities that emphasize public health, uh, health, balanced land use, and waste reduction by intelligent design. Uh, the town has previously communicated a target of carbon neutrality by 2040 for municipal operations specifically. Uh, and the committee believes that a community-wide target should follow pursuant to a climate action plan, which is something we've identified as a bit of emerging uh, standard across uh, forward thinking and, and acting municipalities. And then uh, under recommendations, so going back to the outcome statement that Charlene read a few minutes ago and, and considering the high stakes here, we recommend that the town establishes um, permanent sustainability catalysts spanning uh, our committee, uh, dedicated town staff and community engagement channels. Um, as mentioned on the slide here, uh, you know, we do believe all, all um, efforts should be intentionally inclusive. All right, and the, uh, the next four slides um, really follow our budget recommendations. So these are some items that the committee felt would be um, sort of some first steps. Do we have any questions on the um, framework, the priority areas? Okay. All right, and um, I'll talk a little bit about these so you have some background. Um, so, oops, sorry about that. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, basically with this one, uh, the, um, let's see, the two, these two items reflect the need for standards and benchmarking. So we want to um, continue um, networking opportunities with peer mentors. So other municipalities who are already been at this for quite a while. And um, we have recently joined the Southeast Sustainable Directors Network for the town and some new North Carolina programs. And again, these are um, model municipalities that we can really gain a lot of insight from, best practices. Um, they have grant suggestions, so it's a really good thing to be part of. Um, <clears throat> 
We want to obtain membership to rank, measure, and benchmark our performance through nationally recognized standards. So that's something that we hope to do. And we want to select reporting software so we can collect that energy use data that we spoke about and partner with other um, college, local utilities and others to really represent that and to be able to report back on progress. Okay, and then some efforts are actually already underway. So you've heard probably about the two restrooms that will include solar energy. So that's something that's already been um, captured with these 2017 geo bonds. Um, but the committee felt that what would be helpful is to take a look at doing some energy audits and to take a closer look at LED streetlight conversions. So that is a range of opportunities. So there's some non-decorative streetlights that we could convert for a, a lower price tag. If we look to um, retrofit all the streetlights, it would be a heftier price tag, but that's something to think about over time. A lot of the other municipalities report significant energy savings in these areas. Um, so that's something to think about. Charlene, real quick, while you're on the, the street light thing, how does that work? Or do you know how that works since right now, if the street light goes out in front of my house, I don't call the town, I call um, Duke Energy. So is there a partnership there? Is there a synergy there that because we're gonna be saving energy that they're a partner in this proposal? And then um, I got the LED, but are we also looking at issues of light pollution in addition to energy efficiency? Yes, um, we've actually been considering um, different requirements that we would like to propose to Duke so that when a new light is installed, it's um, sufficient for what we feel is best practices. Um, so that would be something that we're prepared to submit. And it, right now, the you know, all the streetlights are owned by Duke. And so, like you said, when there's an outage, you're calling them. Um, so they basically do all of these LED conversions. So we contract with them. And that's why we have a range of opportunities uh, as far as like how many lamps we want to go ahead and retrofit at a time. Um, and then, you know, we do see the energy savings from that. And it, it could be significant, again, as we gain this energy use data we'll be able to answer that question a lot better. Yeah, and I, I agree with Jane. I was gonna hit on the light pollution as well. And I know David's mentioned it, you know, those lights that are going over the 77 bridge, it's definitely a, a white or a blue light. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of articles on the, the harmful effects of blue lights versus yellow light and not just to people, but also to the environment around it in terms of animals and throwing off their natural cycles and. Um, so I think that we've got a real opportunity here. And Jamie, I would say on that one, if we need to get somebody from Duke Energy and to have a conversation about how we can partner with them uh, to, to make some major improvements on the lighting in Davidson, I think that, that that's something I'd, I'd love for us to do. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, that's super. Okay. So, um, Let's see, so for stormwater, rainwater, um, we've basically, uh, over the process of talking with staff, we found out that there is actually a stormwater infrastructure repair plan already in place, and that's through CIP uh, request. And we also know that there's um, some new water quality initiatives. So we'll really wanna take a look at, a look at you know, the creeks and waterways in town. And um, I think this particular project would be at Roosevelt Wilson Park. So that's um, something new. And then there are some funds available through grants. So um, through the De Department of Environmental Quality. So we didn't really have a budget request, but wanted you to be aware of some of the things that are underway. Charlene, can I follow up on that real fast? Absolutely. Um, kind of to add a little bit of clarity. Um, I think the intention of the recommendation, recommendation of the committee was for a more comprehensive stormwater plan. Uh, um, so that was coming out of the committee. And then at the same time in parallel, Doug was thinking along the same lines. So there's a good link up 
And y'all will see some of that going into the CIP request in next month. So anyway, just to make sure that's crystal clear. Great, thank you. Okay, and then um, again, there's already so much being done in the area of affordable housing. And it's just fantastic. I, you know, we, the committee is aware of all that Davidson has done. Um, so we actually um, had the opportunity to think a little bit more about that and talk more with Eugene um, about some of the critical repair funds and the idea of um, really looking to make affordable housing more energy efficient. So anything that we build as a town, you know, what will our standards look like? And then also um, to assist current homeowners with applying for federal weatherization um, programs so they can already qualify if um, they're low income. Uh, beyond that though, it would be great to look to do some energy audits for existing homes and really again, look to make the homes that are currently here more affordable and lower energy bills. So that's what this um, recommendation is leaning toward. And right now, you know, some of those funds can already be um, maybe shared from the affordable housing fund, but this is something that we feel it could have an immediate impact. Yeah, and uh, I'll pick up on the EV infrastructure opportunities. So the committee consider ways to electrify the town's uh, fleet uh, operating fleet near term and, and staff is recommending um, a neighborhood EV, which is a small utility vehicle with a uh, top speed of 25 miles per hour. So I, I guess no, uh, won't run the risk of getting, uh, of speeding violations on Griffith. Um, and then along with um, that two uh, electric uh, powered bikes, uh, just, just for ongoing use. Um, to follow my earlier comments around EV infrastructure, uh, you know, we're, we're starting from a fairly low base in terms of, of chargers and, you know, have significant opportunities, especially in high traffic areas uh, around the circles of 30. Uh, there are state level grants uh, uh, and rebates available that, that, that uh, we, we've observed and um, there has been heavy interest in oversubscription to date, so we are watching funding rounds for those. Yeah, I think another opportunity could be the parking lot over by the soccer fields at River Run if you wanted to do one at the circles of 30 and then one on the east side. So you kind of have east, central, west covered if, if you're in a tight spot and you're like me and forget to check your gas gauge or electric charge gauge every now and again. <clears throat> Makes sense. Um, and then in terms of uh, ongoing and long term, you know, um, we believe that a framework uh, will allow for clarity, conviction, and, and tangible results with, with all these sustainability initiatives. And you know, through our research, we identify towns of varying sizes across North Carolina and the U.S. that do have sustainability offices with dedicated directors and, and published climate plans and, and, and standing pathways for community involvement. Uh, but in terms of uh, investment, uh, you know, it, it, uh, ongoing uh, component will be essential. And, you know, in terms of, of hard dollars and, and budgets, uh, we just um, essentially expect uh, that to take shape as, as priorities are, are um, really set in motion. Have you guys talked about partnering with, so Ingersoll Rand and Train Technologies, both kind of co-located down off of Beatty Street, have made significant commitments in sustainability uh, over the last year or two, have, have, have you been able to reach out or get in contact with either one of those two businesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm nodding my head a lot because, um, one of the things that we've been doing since uh, I started working for the town is hosting um, a group called Eco Davidson and it's a collaborative group. It's made out of, made up of nonprofit and business leaders and others. And um, Ingersoll Rand has been a partner on that group. So we have a close connection with them, um, TRAIN, now TRAIN too. Um, and then also MSC. Um, so, and then some, some smaller businesses, but it's definitely something that we wanna keep in close contact with them. I did notice that TRAIN um, is on the list of the 66 businesses in North Carolina with 100% renewable goals. So. Um, they've been a they've been a great partner, and it's exciting to hear what they're doing. So definitely, yes. Okay, and and again, if I know train train and Ingersoll Rand were all one, and now they're two, and so if if you need help with connections at Ingersoll Rand, 
I just connected uh, Eugene today on uh, equity and inclusion, and I'm happy to connect you all to the right people if you don't have those connections. And I know that that everybody's looking to be a good corporate citizen, so. Okay, great. Yeah, it's exciting to hear what they're doing with their green teams as well. So internal, you know, internal operations, they're making really good strides. They have composting um, on site uh, for their kitchens. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And uh, definitely a close partner again is Davidson College. So we talk a, a lot with them. Sorry, one last question. Like what about recommendation for the town, right? Like in terms of setting a, a, an objective to be carbon neutral by X date. I mean, I think it's something that we should throw out there. And, and if you don't set the goal, you'll never achieve it. And I would look to this, this group in partnership with Karen, who's uh, got a tall task ahead of her to say, okay, we as a town are going to strive to be carbon neutral by X date and then develop a plan to get there. I'll piggyback on that because it sort of ties into my question, which was about the climate action plan that you mentioned, but it's not part of the budget request. So I assume you're going to work for this data piece first and then move in that direction. Um, so that was my question, but it certainly relates to Matthew's um, in terms of overall goals. Do you want yeah. to answer that, Karen? Or? Uh, Matt looks ready. Matt, go. Oh no, I'll go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, you know we just really want to become informed, uh, and, and you know the the data collection that we especially uh, plan to spearhead this summer with the help of a, a Davidson uh, scholar will really just set us up to to look at you know, the goal. Um, goals that we've already set uh, for the municipality, but also the community and, and start to work backwards. And, and that'll be part of climate uh, action plan formulation. But uh, we, yeah, we really just, uh, I think need the data um, um, to declare the, the starting point for that. And once you get the data, just because I, I know we like to be an over uh, achieving um, municipality. Um, so a lot of the communities that you referenced and that we've seen have a 2050 plan. I'll, uh, I'll pull out my drum again and suggest that we look at what we could do by 2037 um, and hitch that to our, our, our bicentennial wagon. Um, and so it gives you 13 less years than any of those people doing the 2050 plan, but it gives us something else to, uh, to look forward to as a, uh, as a community. And I thought uh, 2040 um, as a municipal operations goal was um, pretty good, but okay, 37, got it. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's set the goal and let's be aggressive on it. And, and we, we can't be afraid to fail, right? You know, you, you got to keep trying and, and push. And so the more aggressive we can be um, and, and just because we, if we get there, wonderful and let's have a big celebration. And if we don't, let's celebrate what we have done and then talk about uh, how, what else we need to do to get there and how we're going to get there. So let's, let's, let's be bold on this and um, let's really show leadership as a, as a, it as a municipality in, in the state of North Carolina and, and, and within the United States. Agreed. And Charlene and Matt, I, I want to commend you for the detail. I, this is a discussion item only tonight, but when I when I got the uh, agenda Friday, I guess it was, and I opened up the attachments, I was kind of blown away. And uh, there, there's a lot of work that went into this, and I really appreciate uh, that you guys have collectively, with, with the sustainability group put your noses to the grindstone and, and and presented what you presented tonight because it it, it uh, you know this is one of those things that it truly takes a village and I think this is this goes hand in hand with our with our comp plan and our strategic plan but uh, to get to the level of where you guys are at right now I mean Charlene your leadership and Matt the work that your group have done I, ca I can't say enough about where we are right now so thank you yeah, the committee was wonderful. They're, they stay very high level and work through it fast. We had quite a significant number of meetings in a short amount of time, but thank you, Marinox. That means a lot. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Uh, certainly want to attribute uh, a lot of the credit to the rest of the committee. You know, it was a very vigorous uh, and wide ranging research effort as we identified you know, priority areas because there's just so much to consider here. And it, and it comes down to very hard to calculate cost benefit uh, evaluations. And, you know, we do feel that, you know, we are uh, we've arrived at, a, um, uh, a, you know, a place where we can really focus. So thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and again, thank you to the whole committee, Matt, please, and Charlie, please pass that on. And Matt, it's it's great to see you jumping in, uh, seeing at the, uh, the the Civics 101 class and and being new to the community, you got young kids and really uh, sacrificing a lot of time and hard work. And so thank you so much for for everything that you do. And please put pass, pass my thanks and all of our thanks on to the, the, the total committee. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot about that too. So, for those that don't know, when the pandemic started, I think Matt's kids were four, two, and one, or something like that. So, one, one three. Yeah. So he's 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 been in the house with three children <laughs> under the age of five for twelve months now, and he still has his hair. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I won't turn around. Maybe or yeah, the gray doesn't quite come through in the lighting. Um, but uh, now, I mean, look, uh, yeah, we, we, the town, we were so thrilled that we, we moved here uh, a, a couple of years ago. And we, we came from Chicago and just couldn't imagine all being an apartment. And I'm sure we've all been closer in either, in either case. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been really enjoyable uh, to, to get involved. And thankfully, a very, very supportive backup crew here. Good deal. Anybody else got anything? Just thank you. And again, thank you guys for the work and we look forward to this moving on to the next next phase. So um, with that, I do wanna acknowledge that Commissioner Sitton has joined us now. So we have a full house. Um, welcome, David. Thank you. Um, and again, Charlene and, and Matt, thanks for the work that you've done. Uh, we move on to item B under new business, with the, which is to discuss non-discrimination ordinance update. And we are gonna bring Eugene Bradley, who is our housing and equity director forward. Yep, and while- and I'll, um, I'll throw you, this to Karen to start off with. Welcome, Eugene. Yeah, Thanks. welcome, Eugene. And while Eugene is coming on and getting ready and pulling up his slides, all that good stuff, I wanted to take a moment and talk about where we are in the process of exploring a non-discrimination ordinance for the town of Davidson. Um, as we all know, the town's core values for years and years and years have embraced that our community is one that's inclusive, it's one of belonging. At your retreat last February, you added equity and inclusion as one of your strategic goal areas. And so Eugene, with your brand new housing and equity board, with some of the changes he's going to walk through in state law at the end of last year, have started, and that's really important, started the process of exploring potentially adding a non-discrimination ordinance to Davidson. Typically, the way we do these things is the advisory board would mold over, they'd talk, they'd meet, they'd have subcommittees, and then they would bring forth a recommendation. Um, but in this case, because of the nature of this ordinance, because of the need for a lot of significant community feedback and input, Eugene's actually gonna give you an update of where things stand today, uh, um, moving on down the path of where this could go. So um, I say all that to say that it's, it's an effort really to be as transparent as possible to as many people as possible to know that this is something that's being worked on at the advisory board level. Um, and really to start talking about and opening up the door for some public comment and conversation um, about, about this topic. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Eugene and he can talk about the work that his very, very brand new committee is doing um, on this important topic. Great, Karen, thank you for that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to see everyone again. Um, we have been busy. Uh, I, I will say thank you for uh, your approval of our, or our bylaws. That's how early we are in the process with our um, housing equity uh, committee. And so we're, we're excited that we're, we're kind of moving things forward. And this is one of our first kind of uh, issues that we're going to tackle. And so I'll, I'll share my screen. We have a brief, uh, a brief uh, presentation for you this evening.
Can everyone see this? Okay, great. Um, so as you guys know, we've been working um, at your direction on our, our non-discriminating ordinance. Uh, we've met our for our first time on this um, last, our, our last meeting was, was last Thursday. We were able to form a subcommittee um, to actually flesh this out um, and talk in, in depth about kind of what, what Davidson, the town of Davidson wants to do here in this space. Um, there's a lot of options there, but we wanted to uh, bring a group together to really talk through it um, and make a formal recommendation at some point to the, uh, the town's board. And so with that, um, a little bit of the history, um, on December 1st, uh, 2020, uh, the General Assembly, uh, Pat, uh, Bill, House Bill uh, 142 actually expired. Uh, what that allowed um, for with municipalities to uh, enact their own local non-discriminative ordinance. Um, this is a, a significant piece. Uh, if you've been reading the news or uh, watching television, this has been uh, something that you've seen uh, municipalities across the state uh, implement their own version of what that looks like for their communities. Uh, and we're at that point. Um, and so we're excited kind of to tackle this and what it really means for the town of Davidson. Um, so what it means is that elected officials are now free to pass our own. Um, and specifically with Davidson, what does that mean? Uh, what are we able to, to do in this space? And so um, our local municipalities are able to uh, enact ordinances regulated specifically private employment practices. Uh, that will include uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, race, color, sex, age, nationality, um, and this is the, will be the new part, the new categories that we want to include. Uh, and really this is, gives us an opportunity to go a little bit further than what you typically see at the, the federal and state level to really make it more personal to what the town of Davidson is about. Um, this is really kind of a, a mission statement about who we are as a, as a community and who we've been and who we wanna be moving forward. So we've been excited to kind of talk about that uh, with our subcommittee within our uh, Housing Equity Board group. So one of the things that we want to consider when we talk about private practice uh, in, or private employment is the General Assembly still has the, uh, the regulation and will retain the right to regulate um, bathrooms, showers, uh, facilities, those types of um, entities. So that will still remain with the, the state and how that's regulated. Um, one of the other pieces is, is really enforcement and how that's going to be enforced. Uh, what staff currently is recommending now that we don't necessarily go down the road of enforcing with the housing and particularly uh, employment. Uh, there are already state and federal um, entities that will deal with those on their own. I think our role here will be to recommend um, any cases that come to us to those proper uh, organizations. For example, in our housing space, if there is housing discrimination that actually will reside with our uh, the CRC group, uh, the Community Relations Committee of the, the city uh, of Charlotte, they actually review those cases and actually do a formal investigation. It's a formal process. So when we do have those types of things, we would we'll, we'll recommend and forward those onto the appropriate organizations to resolve those issues. The other piece um, that we're looking at is the public accommodation and transportation. Um, I think we heard some comments on uh, early on on like what like what does this all mean? Um, and so definitions are very important of how we define things. And that's something that we'll be able to spell out in details. Currently where we are in the process, we're still kind of early in the process of looking at each of our ordinances. But when we talk about public accommodation and transportation, um, we're really talking about hotels, restaurants, hospitals, amusement parks, um, anything that uh, is considered the equal enjoyment of, of, of goods for the public. Uh, transportation specifically, companies and providers are operating um, a privately owned vehicle for, so example, like Uber or a car service, those types of organizations or businesses um, that will fall in that realm. So what, currently where the board is now um, in our subcommittee, we've kind of mulled over uh, a lot of uh, discussion. I think some of the questions that were asked earlier in the public comments that we actually start to talk through and tackle a little bit. Uh, we still got some work to go, uh, but at, as it lays today, um, we looked at a lot of different things, really expanding upon what, this, what the state and federal government already has uh, kind of on the books. We're really looking at new categories like citizens, uh, non-citizens, marital status, pregnancies, um, natural hairstyles, uh, veteran status, uh, religious beliefs, uh, disabilities, 
those types of things we felt that were uh, most inclusive. Uh, I think we kind of erred on the, the most inclusive kind of category. And I know that could be feel a little bit funny for certain folks. I think that came out in public uh, comment, but uh, really, tr really trying to understand why we want to move in this direction. And it's really talking about who we are as a community and what our belief system are here in this town. And so it really uh, kind of leads to our, our next point is how this is going to be enforced. Um, and, and so we looked at a lot of different examples across the state, um, in a couple of uh, municipalities, towns across the state. There's a, ver a variation of how people want to enforce this. Uh, some may be civil penalties, some may be criminal um, offenses. And so what we decide to do, uh, and what's more probably true to the town of Davidson is form a review uh, board, uh, which would be our committee, um, and actually take in those complaints and, and, and then launch a formal investigation. So if there is an issue, a formal complaint is submitted into our committee, we are uh, will launch an investigation. And the, the goal is to uh, meet, have a conversation with the parties involved to get to a mutual agreed upon resolution. Um, we really do believe um, when it comes to these issues, dialogue is, is, uh, is at a prime uh, location in, in the discussion of how we resolve issues as, as neighbors, as, as a resident here. And so we felt like the power really lies with community here um, and really kind of true to kind of who Davidson is. Uh, given our size, I think we have the ability to, to uh, make a lot of groundwork here um, and, and allow folks to you know, voice their issue, but also have uh, opportunity to look at your neighbor in the eye and talk through issues that may be a little tough um, if there was a, a complaint given. And so we, we felt that that was the appropriate kind of uh, way to move forward. Again, this is not a fully baked uh, cake yet, but we, these are things that we're mulling over and, and working and talking through. Um, here are some of the, the comments earlier. These are the things that we're talking about in, in a little bit more detail and we'll continue to talk about um, from um, the process of enforcement. If there's not a resolution, what is the next step? So we are currently working through that, what that looks like with our, with our staff and our town attorney. Um, and get a recommendation of what will make sense for us as a community. And so we're excited to continue that work. Uh, we're, we're still in the process. So uh, we'll, what's provided to you today is kind of where we are. Um, and so really kind of leads us to our next steps. Um, is really staff will be, will be actually crafting a public engagement process. Um, we know that this is a important issue to get right. And so we do believe that the public should be able to weigh in on this and, and get recommendations and answer questions. Um, I think the questions that were posed earlier are good questions and we wanna be able to give other people the opportunity to voice those, not just through public comments on here, but have a system of how we do that. And so we're currently working on what that will look like moving forward. Again, it's not a fully baked cake yet, but we're trying to figure out what will be the best path forward to gain um, input from the public. Um, the second was really um, the Housing Equity Board exploring potential additional uh, classes and categories. Uh, we've kind of did our first kind of grab of what we think makes sense, but there might be things that we miss are missing. And I think through the public process, that might be something that we want to add additional uh, categories to that. So I think being able to engage the public um, over the next coming months will help us formulate uh, what makes sense for us as a town. And so that's something that we're excited about. Um, our hope is to have some type of formal recommendation uh, in the April, possibly May timeframe, depending on how long our public process will be. But that was, that's kind of where we are at current, the current state. Uh, you know, there's some fine tuned things that we want to kind of mull over a little bit more as far as where it lives within our ordinance. And so uh, we want to be able to address that as well. So that is kind of where we are currently. Uh, we will open up for questions um, at this point. Um, for those that have them. Gene, I think um, I think this is great. The question I have, uh, if you go up one slide, or maybe it's two, yeah, uh, now the one right there, the the Equity Board Review Committee. Um, and I think this is a question that I have. It doesn't have any, it, it's actually broader than, than this board itself or this board review committee is, how does that kind of flow upward in terms of do, do you now have a citizen or you know an appointed board that is making these kind of broader based decisions and it doesn't sit in the in the laps of the elected officials you know the, that were elected by 
the entirety of the people. And this isn't just on this board. This has to do with every, every board that ultimately gets to make decisions um, on behalf of the board of commissioners. So um, I just, I get, I don't, I don't know if I want to be the person making that decision, <laughs> but I also don't know if I don't want to be the person making that decision. If, if we're elected by the people and, and as Jim likes to say, the buck stops here. Um, and so I think that that's something that we need to tease out a little bit, not only yep. for this board, but, but in total, um, yep. because I think, I think we were elected to make the tough calls. And so that one I, I could see concerning something doesn't go someone's way. And then it, and then they come to us, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's a great comment. We've been talking about kind of what that looks like internally um, from a, a legal matter, but also kind of what actually makes sense. And so um, our, our thought is it will actually live within the housing equity um, board um, as a subgroup uh, to review those cases. Um, there was a, it was uh, pretty impressive with our, our subcommittee. It was a sense of ownership. You know, if we're gonna make the rules, we should be the ones to be able to explain why we're doing what we're doing. And so I was excited that you have that, that type of energy uh, within this subcommittee. Um, so the idea would be that it would be our subcommittee to review all of the, the cases that are submitted um, into, into us and to make a de determination. Um, and then as far as kind of the levels of escalation, we'll kind of look through with our legal team um, to figure out kind of what that actually looks like. Uh, we'll have that fully baked cake um, in part of our recommendations, if not in the April meeting, but or possibly our May. So we'll be able to answer those, those questions specifically. And I think that was one of the questions that was um, asked earlier, kind of what that looks like. We're still kind of working through that piece, but the goal is to, to own this as a community and not necessarily even for the elected officials, um, but folks that are, that, that, that are your neighbors that are serving on boards. Um, you know, it was excited to see uh, Matt, uh, you know, serving on the sustainability board. These are, these are neighbors, these are new neighbors. These are old neighbors are working together. And so our goal is to, to let us address our issues here. Um, and so we're, we're excited about kind of where, where we're going in this direction. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And again, I, I don't, I think maybe it's, it's potentially an appeal to the board, you know, available to the board and let the board have to make a final ruling if there's an issue. I mean, I, I, I find, find it hard to believe that the board would rule a different way than the, than the people that we appointed, but at least then, then if there's blame to go around, it goes to the people that, that signed up for it uh, through us being silly enough to run, run to be elected officials. So just food for thought. Great. Great. And, and we're, we're at that point of kind of talking through it. It would actually make sense. So all of that is good feedback. I think that's what tonight is about is really to kind of get this in front of you, but also start taking in feedback from, from this board of kind of how we want to craft this. So that is much appreciated. Eugene, thanks for the, uh, the presentation. So, um, you know, while I, um, you know, am supportive of moving forward, I've heard, you know, from one or two folks against, um, but I would say I've heard from folks in support. And I think just moving forward and making sure, as Karen alluded to, that that process is clear and open um, and, and inclusive, um, as you alluded to, rather than rushing to um, a new thing um, to get it faster. I, want, I would prefer to get it right. Um, I shared something um, with Eugene um, earlier today, and I think this might kind of fall in on this slide as well. One of our local businesses um, has essentially, you know, they redid their website and, and essentially has a very prominently stated, this is our business um, ordinance and essentially covers the vast majority of the items you see in this non-discrimination ordinance and says, we reserve the right, you know, to essentially kick you out of any virtual or actual space if you violate, um, you know, our, our non-discrimination um, ordinance. And so, you know, maybe one of the things to add here would be, you know, if other businesses follow through, and I'd included Kim on the email as well, if other businesses have similar things, you know, I'm hoping that we are the community that doesn't have, you know, a bunch of violations, but would you want some sort of reporting structure, you know, to the equity board that, 
you know, this particular business had this example, you know, something happen either in their physical space or in an online space um, and maybe create some sort of structure there. So just, yeah. just as an idea, I hadn't fully, you know, thought it through, but just, um, I think it's worth adding to at least be aware so that, especially if we wind up with multiple businesses, and I hope we would, that there would be that sharing of information, but doing it through the, the equity board. Yeah, that, that's a great comment. And I did see that um, earlier. One of the things we've been talking about internally is really how do we engage our business owners? Um, I think Kim does a, a fantastic job of, of doing that and really being able to understand kind of their world because this could actually be a hindrance to them, but really understand kind of how this can work for them and keep them safe, but also be able to um, express their their views as well. Um, and it's great to hear that businesses are taking their own stand of non-discrimination. That is absolutely a good thing. And so we want to be able to partner with them uh, through our public process to gain their input of how how and what this should look like. So that's, it's, it's dead, dead on center where we're, where we're moving towards. Thank you so much for um, presenting this to us, Eugene, and sort of sharing where y'all are in this and um, this overall journey. And I'll be interested in how other communities um, um, are approaching this in terms of review this review committee, in terms of protected classes, et cetera, um, in what we determine um, is appropriate for protected classes. So. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious in terms of, I'm assuming you're looking at other communities and their ordinances and who left it. Cause I think there, there are some significant differences between them uh, around the state. Yeah, and, and there is, and it really, the, I think one of the biggest differences is the enforcement piece of how that, what that looks yeah. like. And I think it depends on their community, quite honestly, mm -hmm. every community is different in North Carolina. And so kind of what actually works for us is, is kind of what we're trying to understand a little bit better. Um, but there's a variation throughout kind of across the state of when these things are adopted, kind of what's actually in there. I think kind of the inclusiveness piece is there. I think you see a lot of the same type of um, categories, but the enforcement piece is kind of where things differ a little bit. And so we wanted to make sure we're, we respond to that in a, in a personal way, uh, a community way. And so okay. um, but that's kind of how we looked at it. Great, thank you so much. Eugene, thank you. This is, this is one of many reasons that we are glad to have you here. Uh, but it, it's, nice, it's nice to see this in front of us um, really in a short period of time. So we, uh, you know, I, I personally appreciate the, the, the hard work that's gone into this at this point. Uh, it, it, it's just good to see that, that we're moving down a path that we all support and, and that uh, between you and your committee, good stuff's happening. So thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for giving me a great, great uh, board to work with. So uh, you guys had every bit of, of approving that and getting those, those folks recommended. So thank you. Yeah. And, and hey, uh, you know, and Janet mentioned those two emails that we got. It was, it was more of a form letter that looked like you typed your name in and it just kind of auto sent out. Uh, I I'm going to forward that over to you. And I think as we continue to go through this process, I think there's questions or issues um, that, that it, that it has. And if the more that we could just make sure that we're addressing those head on as we move through the process, the better. So I'll forward that over to you just in an effort to um, make sure that we're addressing those concerns. Great. Thank you. And I can share my replies to, to the two that I received as well. Awesome. Yeah. yeah Jane, maybe, maybe you just forward your replies, which has the form in there and then Kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. Great. I think there would be some value in asking Gene and the committee to identify key questions. For example, you mentioned that the ordinances vary from place to place and that we could have a public discussion uh, at the board level and, and plot the best direction for the town to go, as, as opposed to, to the board taking a passive role and then the final product is uh, essentially presented for an up or down vote. Yeah, I, 
think that all of that is on the board. I think uh, as we kind of work through this and get, get feedback from you guys, uh, we'll be able to craft this thing how it needs to be. Um, you know, and I think Jane had said, nail, nail it right on the head. We want to not rush through this, but get it right. Um, and so I think that is an important thing that we want to make sure we, we do here. Um, and so I think the more dialogue we have and kind of, um, kind of the influence that this board may want to have on final decisions or just on the front end, we can talk through those um, and, and make it make sense for everyone. Um, so I, that, that's great, great feedback. Anything else for Eugene? Or have no, you I, I, I think this is a big step forward as a community committed to equal justice. Uh, I, I think this is just very important uh, step in the town's history. And um, I really appreciate Eugene, appreciate the committee, and um, we, we need to move forward together. Thank you for that. Okay. With that, we will move on to the next agenda item. Thank you again, Eugene. Thank you. Uh, and this is to review upcoming agenda items and I'm gonna turn this over to town manager, Jamie Justice. All right, thanks mayor. So a few, few items on the horizon, we've got our document attached to the agenda. Uh, Tuesday, April 13th is our next board meeting. A couple things to lift up there. We want to talk about the status on the 2017 general obligation bond projects. You all have authorized a lot of work in this area. And so we've been moving forward. And so we want to talk about where we are there. That's a bit of a primer as we're heading into budget and talking about the capital improvement plans so of the CIP. So talk about that. And then related, you know, we're, we're tracking towards doing this spring for not only the 17 bond projects, but also the 2019 public facilities geo bonds. So Pete will want to talk about what's coming. So you'll, you'll be a part of that discussion. I do have a question mark on the private development projects in Cornelius. We are still monitoring that. And so I'm um, thinking we, we should have the information to be able to have a discussion at this meeting. Just a reminder, what we're looking at is there are two projects on the Cornelius side uh, adjacent to Antiquity that will be adjacent to South Street. One project has submitted in Cornelius, and that's the project that's related to the old Mecklenburg Brewery site. The second project as of yet has not submitted, and that's the one that's the Prophet Dixon project that's closer to South Street. And what our intention is, is once that's submitted, then we actually have a specific project to look at and we can analyze that and bring that information to be able to talk to you all about. And that's important to have that second one because they've got to work in concert and actually knowing what's out there. So that's the intention here. And I just wanted to share that so that everybody understands and knows that that's, that's why we're wanting to get that information so we have something to talk about. So that's the intention there. And Amy, is some of the confusion the fact that the drawings for one project seem to reflect the other project? Yes, yes, probably, because I think the one project in particular, the Prophet Dixon one, we expect that that will work in piggyback or in concert with the old Mecklenburg Brewery and vice versa. So yes, they are connected. And it's important that really we have both of those to fully be able to understand what's being proposed. All right, those are the things for the 13. Jamie. Yes, sir. Um, I would suggest uh, you add the potential for a closed session uh, for a legal update. Yes, sir, That's, I agree with you. And so we'll, we will work and determine, and we likely will need to have one. 
The other thing tonight, you all mentioned the vested rights, kind of doing the white paper on that. So that we'll add that in April on one of these meetings here. So we'll work with Jason on that. So I did pick that up as an action item. And then for April 27th, a couple highlights. Uh, you heard from Eugene tonight, not sure if the Housing and Equity Board will actually have a recommendation on the non-discrimination ordinance. So I'm not sure exactly when we'll discuss that, whether that's April or May. So that's a question mark, kind of where that's going. But we'll keep going through the deliberative process there. Growth Management Planning Board up committee. That group is, uh, we had to kind of put that on hold a little bit for the Board of Adjustment hearing stuff. And we're ready to pick that back up and bring that update to the town board. So we're looking at that. The downtown gathering space, phase two, that was something where the board had said, we wanna work on phase two and see if we can advance that. And so uh, Doug's working with the engineers on that. Another action item was you all heard the update on the fiscal impact analysis. And then the board had said, let's, let's work on some scenarios. So Kim Fleming's been working on that with Jason and that they'll be, be ready to talk about that. So those are the things we're looking at for April 27th. And then if I could just mention key future items, just so you all know it's what's on the radar. So as you all know, budget's coming up. So we'll have the budget stuff with May and June, budget CIP. We'll also have a key checkpoint on public facilities with the guaranteed maximum price. So that's, that's important there as well. Another strategic plan item that you all prioritize is downtown planning in terms of how we wanna address that. So we'll wanna have some discussion about that process, about what that looks like. And then the most recent meeting, we talked about the annexation agreement between Morrisville and Davidson, and then also how do we look work on some planning options for that South Iredell, the future Davidson area. So I'm work, we're working on those now, and the hope here is we can expedite those up into, get those to you all as soon as we can, uh, the, the last two in particular. So I just wanted you to know those are on our radar and we're working hard to move forward. That's all I got in terms of just what's on the horizon. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I, my suggestion would be, again, tentatively, uh, we look to have a thoughtful public discussion about the non-discrimination ordinance uh, at a time when it can be referred back to the committee to, to fill in the gaps, the uh, put in the punctuation as it were. That does make I mean, sense. I think there are a number of, of serious questions, some raised tonight, some not. And it would be helpful for my two cents worth uh, to have a public discussion of those issues with, with time for people to have uh, input before we get around to getting a final recommendation. Can I, can yeah. I jump in there real fast, Jamie? Yes. I wanna be careful, um, Commissioner Fuller, that we have asked the advisory board to bring y'all a recommendation. So I don't wanna inadvertently feel like we're pulling the rug out from under them. So I wanna make sure that I really understand what you're asking. Are you saying, as they bring forth what they have researched, what they've seen in other communities, what they feel like would work in Davidson from their perspective, that then we begin that public engagement process and have that public discussion that it isn't a bring to y'all and then immediately vote, but then that opens up more of the public comment consideration, what are their definitions? Um, because I do wanna be mindful of the work that they have been doing um, on this topic. Thanks. I mean, just my two cents jumping in, um, Karen, was the fact that I kind of saw it as to what you were agreeing is that we've asked them to put forth the work and then just looking at the, the timing of such things to, to see the recommendation that they bring forth, then have public engagement based on the recommendations that they've brought forth, um, you know, for pick whichever discussion we were having, we do understand that the buck stops with us on, on the initial proposal of the ordinance. Um, but I think it's, we need to hear their input. We, we specifically timed out this process to get their input. But then once we have it, then, 
you know, and Jim, I don't know whether that addresses your concern, but you're exactly right. We need that public input, but I think the public input would be based on the work that we've asked the, the board to do over the past two months. Yeah, I, th I think, um, so let me talk about how I would have envisioned this pre-COVID, <laughs> which is, and, and then you find a way to modify accordingly, uh, with, which is, I'm sure is an easy task. The, the, the committee would come back with recommendations and some sort of broader policy outline. We would then go on what I would call the road tour where we would be sitting down and having those community conversations with each one of the areas. You know, we would be out uh, at the church in West Davidson. We would be at, in Summers Walk, we'd be in River Run, we'd be in St. Albans, then having kind of uh, formal public information Q and A's to make sure that we're, we're taking it on the road and, 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 and making sure that we were thoroughly and thoughtfully communicating it to, to the town. So, that can't happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so how do you create a plan B version of that? And I think that's when Eugene on his last side, that first bullet was like staff development's public input plan. That's what that, that was getting at. And there's, you know, there's our normal tools, which is, you know, the speak up, public comment, some of these neighborhood meetings. And, you know, I think there's a little bit of optimism that it's getting warmer. Maybe we can do some things in person outside to facilitate better conversation in this space. But th that's that's part of what he is wanting to work through um, with that committee. Jim, do you you were the one that initially brought it up. Jane and I tried to interpret thoughts. Um. Uh, I will um, I will try to work with uh, whatever process we have. Well, I certainly think Karen. I think the intention here is we'll come up with some ideas and we can share share our proposed process with the board, and then maybe we can all coalesce around a path forward. Hundred percent agree, and that's part of the um, kind of the the kickoff of that we are bringing this to you way early such that the community is aware that this is a conversation that's occurring um, and some of these things haven't been all the way fully decided um, from a process standpoint. Fair enough, thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Anything else for the common good? Yeah, the one thing I wanted to bring up, we've, we received a few emails about the development um, that looks like it's trying to tie in the construction entrance off of Boulder Rock Loop. And I know Andrew, Jamie has, has gotten back to, to the residents. I mean, we saw 80, 80 citizens, 80 plus citizens saying, hey, I went out there and I looked at the site and that road is very, very narrow. Um, and, and Jane, back to your question about what happens to all these roads when these big construction vehicles come in and then we've got to start paying to, paying to repave it, right? Um, I think an entrance off of Davidson Concord Road makes sense. And so what I would ask is, Jamie, is that we, we push, I know NCDOT said yes, as long as there's sight lines and just push the developer to say, find the right sight line and, and get it in off of Davidson Concord Road and tear up NCDOT's roads, not the town of Davidson's roads. You uh, hit the nail on the head in terms of our strategy. So the update is we don't have it yet. But we're working to try to get developer concurrence with exactly what you just said and determine that DOT will approve where the mm -hmm. construction entrance will go and so that there's no hiccup. And that once that's agreed to, then we can share that out that, hey, great news. We've, we've figured out a construction entrance. Yeah, when you say developer concurrence, if we say, hey, this is where you're coming in off of I mean, I, I'm not, I appreciate wanting to make sure that they feel like they're being included in the conversation, but I really don't want a bunch of trucks driving through a neighborhood and parking. I mean, I, I just see another example of trucks parking in a West Branch issue of people's driveways being blocked and just a, the, we just need to, we need to work with NCDOT on where that right entrance is and go back to the developer and say, here's where your construction entrance is and not say, would it be okay if 
I, I, I wouldn't lead with the question. I would lead with a statement. I got gotcha. you. Um, it, it still works that the developer is going to have to do it. So, I'm, but I'm with you in that we've heard the feedback. It's an important topic and that that's what we want. And I think that's, I think I, I agree with that. So I think we're going to try to, we're going to work <clears throat> that outcome. I can't imagine, I can't imagine developers not going to be willing to work with us on this. If there is an issue, I will let you know. Okay. And, and we have a history of passing no construction vehicles on certain roads, at least for temporary periods of time, right? So there's another way around that if, if people aren't willing to work with us. I'm optimistic we can resolve this amicably. Great. Anything else? Totally changing the subject and, and really not wanting to end on a down note. So I'm hoping somebody can, can pick this back up afterwards. Um, but I just, for me, connecting the dots between the work <clears throat> that we will do on a non-discrimination ordinance, um, and then I look at, you know, in this past week, we've had two more mass shootings um, that however you pull those things together, the thing that, that really hit home um, for me this afternoon was the description of Boulder as a, you know, as a college town. I mean, it's a university town, but when they listed the, um, the names and the ages of the victims, um, there was a very direct connection of saying, this was university and community, the roughly the same number of folks in their, in their 20s as there were folks in their 40s and their 50s. Um, so, I just, I just look at this and believe the more that we can have an inclusive community, um, you know, it's, it's not going to preclude. And, and I sure hope to goodness that, that we are never a location, um, you know, for something terrible. But I just believe that the work that we do and the community, the, the community spirit that we build and develop um, in and around Davidson is so important. And I, I think we should all agree for a community that is a, a sister town and gown community um, that had such a, a devastating event. Yeah, I think the way to the way to look at it positively, Jane, is, is that, you know, we are taking all the right steps. And I, and I think that overwhelmingly um, these this ordinance will go with with far more support than resistance, and um, that's that's why we're all here because that's the type of community that we want to live in. I think we also ought to take a look at a revised core value that reflects the breadth of our commitment to inclusion. And I, I probably wouldn't have said that six months ago, but I, I think what is happening now to our Asian American brothers and sisters, some of the attacks on the streets of New York, uh, although certainly different in kind than Atlanta, are really no less disgusting. And I think it wouldn't hurt us to, uh, to ask uh, Eugene and the committee uh, to take a look at whether it would be appropriate for us to in include a broader statement, not just of non-discrimination, but of inclusion. And if so, what that should be. Fair enough. And, I, and I'm going to try to end the meeting on, a, on an even higher note than that. Uh, I don't necessarily call attention to people's birthdays, but, you know, I, I have always my entire life, and I still do to this day, have called Evelyn Carr my second mother. And tomorrow is her 90, 90th birthday. So if you get a chance, go give sh a shout out to Miss Evelyn tomorrow because it's a big day in her life. And, and, at some point tomorrow, I will be partaking in Coca-Colas and Oreos at her house, I can promise you. So uh, 
at any rate, I, I, again, I don't, I don't want to slight anybody when I miss a birthday, but Evelyn has been my second mother my entire life, and she's turning 90 tomorrow, so it's under my purview to acknowledge it right now. I hope to be in her shape and her fitness level at 90. I can I aspire to to be to be there when I'm her age. Rusty? Yes, sir. I think it would be appropriate without formal discussion or vote if people could indicate with a nod whether you could give Miss Evelyn a big happy birthday from each and every one of us. Will do. Will do. All right, anything else? Motion to adjourn. I need a motion. Commissioner Fort's made the motion. I'm going to do a roll call. Commissioner Sitton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell? Yes. Commissioner Michael? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Yes. Commissioner Ford. Yes. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Good meeting, and we'll see you soon. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, you guys. Good night.